Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Savita Bhutola, the Honorary Secretary of the Indian Association of Palliative Care. And on behalf of the IPC, I welcome all the distinguished speakers for the webinar being organized by the IPC on the very important topic of advanced care planning. Uh, Dr. Sushma, the president who was supposed to deliver this welcome address uh, is unable to attend because of some urgent commitment. So on her behalf and on behalf of the association, um, a very warm welcome to all the distinguished panelists and all our participants. Uh, the aim of this discussion is going to be to understand all the nuances of matters related to end of life care decision making and uh, to provide a guidance to physicians who can then assist individuals and families uh, regarding decisions of withholding, withdrawing care and all of these in the light of the latest guidelines which have come in from the Supreme Court. So the moderator for the discussion is going to be Dr. Shivkumar Ayer. I'm just going to introduce him briefly. Dr. Ayer completed his MD medicine in 91 from BJM Medical College, Pune, and uh, his DNB in 93. Uh, he's done the European Diploma in Intensive Care in 2000 and completed the UNESCO Bioethics course. He has worked in intensive care and has been a practicing physician for the last 31 years. He has recently completed his MSc in Palliative Medicine from Cardiff University. And he has been president of the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine and is a member of ELICIT, the End of Life Care Task Force in India. He is currently working as professor and head of the Department of CCM at Bharti Vidya Peet. Uh, and Medical College Pune, and he's an adjunct professor in CCM at Manipal University. He has been faculty at several national and international conferences, and uh, recently in the concluded I, he was the clinical lead for IUC, ICU palliative care tracks. His main interests are ethics, philosophy of medicine, communication, especially end of life care communication, and palliative care in the ICU. So I welcome all of you. And uh, now I ask Dr. Shivkumar to kindly take over and introduce our distinguished panel for the day. Thank you, Savita, for this uh, very kind introduction. Uh, it is uh, really an honor for me to you know, uh, moderate this uh, distinguished panel of experts. And uh, when I say experts, they are really experts in their field. You know, we have with us um, Dr. Raj Mani, uh, who's been a past president of the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine, is a pulmonologist, and um, he has worked. His work on end of life care uh, in India is unparalleled. He has, uh, you know, authored all the uh, ICCM guidelines so far. He's been instrumental in our um, link with the Indian Association of Palliative Care and the Indian Association of Neurology, and in forming the Elicit Task Force which has played a human role in our country in you know, changing the legal climate of end of life care. And of course, uh, we've done so many uh, public meetings together. So I welcome Dr. Mani. Then of course, we have uh, Dr. Roop Gursahani with us. He's uh, another chairperson of the Elicit Task Force. He's a neurologist at the uh, PD Induja Hospital, Mumbai. And um, for the last few years, he's uh, you know, crusader in uh, uh, end of life care, not only that, but also the neuro palliative care. And he's been running several workshops on neuro palliative care. He's very vocal. And I think he has a great interest in advanced care directors. We'll be hearing him shortly. Then the next person, unfortunately, Dr. Nagesh Sima, he is uh, part of the panel, but he couldn't be with us. I have, uh, he sent me his answer in writing. So, I will be reading that, that out as we go along. Then we have Dr. Naveen Salins. Dr. Naveen Salins is a professor and head of the Department of Palliative Medicine and Supportive Care at the Kasuba Medical College, Manipal. And, uh, you know, for the palliative care community, I think he does not need an introduction. Uh, you know, we were talking recently and we learned that he's uh, recently been appointed as the Associate Dean Research at the KMC Manipal. Also, he's been awarded the European Impact uh, Award for Palliative Medicine, which he will be going to receive in Rotterdam. 
so these are the uh, doctor panelists and we have one other panelist uh, who is equally distinguished non doctor uh, dhwani mehta and uh, you know dhwani mehta is part of a firm a legal firm called vidhi legal policy and uh, they've really really played such an important role apart from on you know, the initial part uh, which was done by a uh, gentleman called mr kokle and uh, now uh, dhwani in the latest amendment that happened in the uh, supreme court uh, she uh, represented the indian society of critical care medicine and lsc and was instrumental in getting this across to the legal fraternity so she's you know she's worked so closely with lsc that i mean she's almost a doctor in end of life care yeah and uh, so we are very happy to have her as well on this panel without much uh, more introductions uh, let me quickly go to the first question and um, i'd like to say that uh, the first question i had posed was actually to uh, dr mani uh, dr uh, sima uh, and the question was how can the palliative care community facilitate the process of appropriate end of life care so i'm going to read the answer that he has sent to me and then i'm going to ask dr navin uh, to respond so he says that the awareness of what good end of life care means is very poor amongst the majority of healthcare professionals the palliative care practitioners are aware of this subject and they have experience in dealing with people nearing their end unfortunately uh, the palliative care community is very small they are very well trained in communicating distressing news so what he feels is uh, dr sima feels is that palliative care teams must reach out to icus and it's important that they in whichever hospitals they are they must play a role in help formulating the end of life care policies uh, and integrating palliative care they should guide on the documentation needed it's a role which you know navin has played par excellence at uh, kmc manipal the blue maple document is an example uh, they should be uh, there as part of assisting in difficult conversations offering communication skill sessions and teaching the uh, others especially the intensive care community about how to communicate and uh, this is something which you know roop has always been pointing out that the intensive care community needs to get trained in uh, communication skills then educating and clarifying the legal position uh since with the new as supreme court judgment things are easier educating and supporting the concerned people on good eolc in the home care scenario because that's another uh, segment which is equally important then facilitate the availability of equipments for uh providing good end of life care palliative care uh, at home like syringe drivers etc create awareness among family physicians about certifying death uh, which you know is a uh, thing which people do struggle with in the home care environment and creating resources for sharing of best practices and then of course last but not the least uh, advocacy which uh, you know uh, dr sima has been uh, really a vocal votary of and i think all of us need to pitch in and the palliative care people should probably take the lead uh can i uh request navin and then if anybody else wants to say something on this yeah uh thank you dr ayer so my comment here is that uh, when i looked at 2022 statistics uh the hospital death was 1.5 million deaths happened in the hospital and you know traditionally when palliative care uh, was uh came into effect in india it came into effect mainly as a a community based palliative care you know uh, with the kerala movement that uh, it had so we were actually divorced from the mainland that is the hospital where the maximum deaths were happening and deaths were happening outside the hospitals too but if we have to talk about and what do you mean by an appropriate end of life care the first and foremost thing is where are you situated you know uh, to 
benefit the the maximum number of people who are dying in india the still the percentage of people dying in the hospitals are much much higher than that at homes so you need to be appropriately situated you know and palliative care community being situated within the hospital as in hospital based palliative care would uh, have a huge impact on how we provide because you know before providing something it has to be available isn't it so making it available across all hospitals especially acute hospitals and not just restricting ourselves to only cancer but to all uh, life limiting and critical illness setting i think is the key factor that would change the equation of providing an appropriate end of life care unless our presence of palliative care is there in all acute and hospitals we would not be able to provide i think everything will else will come after that once your your presence is made fit if you see across india there are several hospital big hospital where there is no presence of palliative care isn't it then whatever we talk about appropriateness unless we are talking in terms of huge upskilling of the existing specialist in providing end of life care that's a that's a, a different story altogether so this is my take uh, on this uh, question uh, you know if i may uh, ask uh, dr mani to um, you know supplement this uh, regarding the palliative care uh, what kind of model uh, would be suitable what role should the um, intensivist play what role should the palliative care person play how to integrate it your comments sir and then i could see roop putting up his hand so maybe roop can also respond after dr mani you see as of now a palliative care department exists only in a very few places they exist in academic teaching hospitals like uh, navins or in some places like uh, induja you know in a few and far between but be that as it may even if i had a flourishing palliative care department in my hospital i would orient and train and develop intensivists as also uh, skilled in palliative care you know not skilled as a specialist but skilled as a generalist because i think uh, palliative care is uh, one part of it is uh, the skill another part is the orientation right it is the approach palliative care adds to the dimension of the technical and technological intensive care and uh, that is uh, becomes otherwise very limited if you don't add this dimension it becomes very limited then these concepts such as end of life care improving quality of dying they all look very very out of place right unless you have this culture culture of caring a uh, culture of improving the overall quality of a intensive care experience for one thing then comes the dying experience and the grieving experience so i would definitely have the hybrid model you know if you have three models one is a having a palliative care consultative model another one is having an inti uh, sort of uh, essentially intensive care um, <clears throat> sort of uh, empowered with palliative care skills and third one is hybrid of course you since all departments are developing uh, rapidly you would need a uh, you would need a dedicated uh, you know specialist uh, palliative care in palliative care but that alone is not enough another thing i must tell you it takes a while for even a palliative care specialist to orient themselves to the intensive care requirement right the environment in intensive care the the high tech and the rescue that is going on and the whole attitude of physicians there and the family so i would go for the hybrid model where we learn from each other it is not a compartment separate compartment the palliative care intensivists they both have to learn from each other as they go learn on their feet Uh, thank you sir you know uh, i would uh, second what dr mani is saying we have a palliative care physician who has recently joined us at um, 
uh, our medical college and um, she's she's from tata but uh, you know when uh, she deals with uh, patients who are in the icu and are critically ill it is always a challenge because the uh, transition to palliative medicine is um, being done by the intensive care specialists the family has a rapport already and uh, then to bring in the palliative medicine person is always a challenge but what we've realized is that if you are able to get them in earlier and uh, you know pitching in earlier is also an art you know without uh, going into the entirely into the palliative thing supporting uh, establishing a relationship with the family so i think the uh, learning curve and i think uh, navin from uh, manipal they've got this so how the palliative person can uh, help within the icu is something which i think we need to work on as well uh, roop you wanted to say something yeah so uh, i think uh, where we are getting a little uh, maybe uh, I, i completely agree with most of what uh, uh, dr mani said and uh, what uh, navin also said before that uh, except that uh, we are perhaps uh, losing sight of which is the cart and which is the horse uh, if you look at this whole business of withholding and withdrawing life supporting treatment we are facilitators of patient autonomy right that is the cart what is the horse patient autonomy how do you harness the horse then that is advanced care planning you put the two of them together and then and then only the whole system works now if you look at it a little systematically you'll remember you'll understand that Uh, i was actually going to say this a little later but i thought since this discussion is on i might as well finish this point off advanced care planning has historically not been linked with palliative care palliative care origin united kingdom in the 1960s advanced care planning living wills first living wills united states okay again around the 60s 70s came out as a human rights issue right uk a national health service universal health care united states insurance private the individual right so you can see that these two concepts and systems evolved completely independently for a good 20 odd years right uh living wills eventually evolved to advanced directives because you needed to incorporate a uh, a uh, uh, agent who would interpret and actually make the living will happen and then eventually it was realized that the whole thing that they were focusing too much on the document and you needed to actually convert it into a process now when we take a dna r we are actually doing acp process that too is part of acp except that it is coming right at the end uh, whereas if you look at it acp has to start off well as soon as you are an adult as you are as soon as you are able to make your decisions so just to clear this up remember that traditional palliative care is oncology dominant because it is oncology dominated we make no ethical decisions cancer biology calls all the shots most acp conversations ideally have to ha- be had with the well person whereas palliative care looks at ill people so i propose to all of you who are listening in that if palliative care takes on the responsibility of acp and it almost looks like we are doing that then this will be a new venture the united kingdom is not very strong on acp because the palliative care is strong and nhs is highly trusted right so we we have to look at for our models we have to look at elsewhere and uh, i know our palliative care is largely dominated by the united kingdom so we need to kind of understand this i think one is also coming in now okay so uh, let me know <laughs> i i kind of butted in onto a question that was not mine but let me know when no um i mean you very nicely uh, transitioned into your question okay and, 
yes because your question was you know uh, what can lead uh, to uh, the conversation with a patient or a family for preparing an advanced care directive how can we help so okay. so this was a more general question and uh, you know i agree entirely with you roop when you say that uh, the us and uk have different orientations and the human rights thing is very strong in the united states only thing is you know in the united states that human rights thing has been driven largely by the affluent and okay. if, you, if you look at the uh, less privileged people in the us they are very wary of uh, uh, of many of the things that happen with regard to advanced care planning and so I... the challenge in our country to be able to directly adopt that so i oh. think i want you to first respond to this uh, thing what do you think how can we help and then of course whatever you want to say so actually you gave me two questions yes <laughs> so the i'll answer the first actually i mean wherever uh, surveys have been done in other asian cultures which are largely similar to ours roughly between 70 to 90% of people say that they like the idea of advanced care planning they would like to engage in it they would like to engage in it with their family the only uh, correct me if i'm wrong navin because you have a far better idea of the literature the only place where something like this was done was uh, priya's study in pune where she asked place of death where would you want to die and in india again uh, well almost 90% of people did have a choice right so if you look at it people do have a choice now you weigh that against the fact again i'm coming back to that same point and that is trust you got this point coming up a little further right it's also a question of trust if you trust your family if you trust your healthcare provider if you trust your systems uh then this whole process becomes simple and easy everything falls into place when you don't have trust and especially if you are an ethnic minority and this specifically applies to african americans in the us who feel discriminated against they feel that acp is when they make a living will it is going to be used to remove their life support at the end yeah you have a problem we are very far away from that we don't need to worry about that i agree we are very far away so uh, your uh, do you want me to does anybody want to come in on this because then i can take on my the main question that i was asked you see i, I want to say uh, something you know i can may i may i just yeah, butt in yeah please please uh, you know see the reality on the ground if i walk into the icu every day okay then all these sort of they look distant okay putting in place an acp system for talking about the community palliative care you see urgently the need for palliative care orientation on the ground of physicians of all you particularly intensivists and that and because at every stage you see the conversation is in there the orientation is in there and therefore the care of the dying isn't there absolutely you know i'm i i know that we have a long way to go but here there is a sense of urgency we do not have to have that way very very long okay we have to find a way to immediately address the the uh, urgency of the situation on the ground in an icu so i think there are two things here you know one is the uh, it's like you know saying that prevention is better than cure so um, if you are able to prevent icu admissions it will definitely be easier for us to tackle and i think we are at the prevention part with uh, roop's question so uh, i'm going to go ahead and uh, if navin wants to quickly comment something otherwise then i'll go to the next question yeah, preventing icu care is not even a realistic utopia <laughs> okay forget about utopia yeah. preventing icu admission so ah. no no icu admission is correct but then on a large scale preventing icu deaths Oh my God! Even that's, the advanced nations haven't done it where it is. ACP is very well. Uh, I agree that has to be a part of our vision. That has to we have to work at it. But when you walk ground into your ICU different. tomorrow, what are you going to do? How are you going to deal with this? The ground reality is different. I agree, sir. So you know the next question actually um, was to um, uh, Dwani, and uh, Dwani. So you know we've. Um, have uh, advanced care planning 
uh, brought in in the 2018 Supreme Court judgment, and um, uh, it looked very difficult. And now, of course, we have the uh, 2023 judgment. So, can you just uh, brief us about um, uh, the uh, legal current situation regarding advance care directives, and how can people go about it? Sure, sure. Thank you, Doctor Iyer. I'll I'll be very uh, brief and uh, you know try and avoid using as much legalese as possible. So the basic point from the I mean the basic principle that was laid down in the 2018 judgment still remains, which is that advanced medical directives have been granted recognition as legally valid documents, and this is an important step because you know previous legislative attempts. to uh, regulate the framework around end of life care have rejected the use of advanced medical uh, directives so this judgment in 2018 itself brought about an important change but the problem as you rightly pointed out was with the process of implementation so this has been uh, changed in two ways first the process of execution of an advanced medical directive has been simplified so initially under the 2018 judgment you could execute this instrument only before a judicial magistrate of the first class so you know we had you know this experience with a couple of patients we went to a district court we asked a district court to designate someone as a judicial magistrate then we asked the patients to get two witnesses and all this had to be done in a courtroom it was a very uh, cumbersome process that has now been changed so now it has become a process that everyone is more familiar with which is notarization so all you need to do now is to execute your document it still needs to in preferably independent witnesses but once this has been done this, this this document can be notarized so ideally you should execute this kind of directive in the presence of a notary or as the supreme court judgment says in the presence of a gazetted officer and usually you can find a list of all the gazetted officers in your state um on the, on 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 a website uh, but of course most people do have easier access to notaries so that process is 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 likely to be uh, simpler so that's what that's what's changed as far as the execution of the advanced medical directive goes the implementation of it has also undergone a change and i mean here i should emphasize that this applies both to patients who have executed an advanced medical directive as well as those who may not so this process was intended to apply to the withholding and withdrawal of uh, medical treatment in terminally ill patients or patients in a persistent vegetative state the initial judgment had laid down a complicated process this has now been simplified in the following manner so the first is that your treating team or your treating physician as well as two subject experts should be satisfied that your that withholding or withdrawing treatment in a particular case is beneficial and i'm being very uh, simple here i mean there are some uh, qualifications that the court has laid down about the experience of these two subject experts so everyone has to be at least 5 years uh, have at least 5 years experience so in a hospital setting at the first stage you have a primary medical board that comprises your treating physician as well as two subject experts they first certify that withholding or withdrawing treatment in a particular case is beneficial this applies and again i must emphasize here it applies only when the patient themselves has lost decision making capacity so as far as the patient can still continue to express their wishes exercise understand information provided to them uh, make decisions uh, regarding withholding or withdrawal that decision must be respected in that case there is no need to go through the process that i am about to describe all of this kicks into place only when the patient themselves has lost decision making capacity so once that happens there are two scenarios that can occur one is the existence of an advanced medical directive and one is the the absence of one now where an advanced directive exists uh, and again here there's a duty for uh doctors and hospitals but maybe i'll come to that a bit later because i think one of your later questions is what can hospitals do to implement some of these uh, guidelines right so i'll come to that aspect later here i'm only giving a brief introduction or overview to what the simplification has been so as i said 
The first step is that you have this primary medical board. The second is you have a secondary medical board, which is to comprise of a doctor nominated by your district chief medical officer and any two other subject experts who are not part of your primary board. So uh, these could be from your hospital, they could be from outside, it doesn't matter. The doctor nominated by your chief medical officer could also be from, uh, from your hospital or outside. This board also has to sign off on the fact that withholding or withdrawing is the right uh, course of action. And once this happens, and once there is consensus amongst the uh, relevant people, now who are these relevant people? Where there is an advanced medical directive, you have to have the consent of the people named in that directive as the surrogate decision makers. Where there is no advanced medical directive, you have to have the consent of whoever you as a treating team have identified as the next of kin or the next friend. Once that consent is there, once there is a consensus from two tiers of a, a medical opinion about withholding or withdrawal, the hospital can go ahead, I mean, the treating team can go ahead and implement withholding or withdrawal, which uh, in the case of advanced medical directives means you can go ahead and implement the wishes in that advanced medical directive. After having intimated all of this to the uh, relevant jurisdictional uh, judicial magistrate. So as a hospital, you have to send some of this information to this judicial authority. And then after that, you can uh, uh, withhold or withdraw. So this is the basic process now. Initially, the process involved multiple, I mean, the same number of boards, but with experts with many more years of experience and boards that had to be constituted by the district collector, and where permission of the judicial magistrate had to be obtained before withholding or withdrawal. So all of that has been uh, done away with. It's essentially now uh, a decision that is taken by medical teams as well as the next of friend or next of uh, next friend or next of kin. So I can stop there if you, I mean, I can always answer more questions no. about what you know. that you should contain and how you should execute it, et cetera. Sure. I'm sure that will come up during the course of the conversation as well. You know, I mean, the uh, title of our webinar is Recent Am Amendments. And uh, thank you, Dwani. You've given us a you know, bird's eye view of the change that has occurred. So advanced care planning has become easier. Uh, preparing an advanced care directive is now simpler. It can be done with just notarization. And the hospitals uh, having to have two medical boards is also become easier with lesser amount of experience. And like you pointed out, in the second me medical board where you have to have a doctor nominated by the chief medical officer, that um, I've been told that it is possible that you can convince the chief medical officer to nominate someone from, if that hospital has got say a transplant uh, program, then someone in the brain death committee can play that role. So these people are already empaneled by the uh, government. And so they could easily play that role. So this is something which we need to work on actively. And I don't know if anybody in the panel who has already uh, prepared these medical boards. So is there uh, Naveen or Dr. Mani or Dr. Roop, any any uh, progress in their hospitals on this? Sir, we oh, have... Yeah. Okay, Naveen, go ahead. Uh, so we have uh, developed uh, the both the primary and secondary board, although we call it as by different name, we call it as an endorsement board and ratification board. Right. So, uh, so endorsement board does the endorsement that the continuation of treatment is potentially inappropriate. So we have three consultants signing that endorsement document. Then we have a ratification board, which ratifies the endorsement decision. So in the ratification board, uh, we have uh, three people, but not exactly as uh, stated by the law. And what we are planning is that we have asked our chief medical officer, because one of the ratifying person is the medical superintendent. So we asked uh, the chief medical officer of our district to nominate the medical superintendent as the CMO nominee, because there has to be one person in the second board to be the nominee of the CMO the chief medical officer. So, uh, so we have these two boards and that uh, completes our document. So it's a four part document. 
The first part is an endorsement uh, uh, board completing document. The second part is the, uh, the document on uh, uh, family meeting document. The third part is the consent document. And the fourth part is the ratification document. So it's together, uh, it goes in all together as one single document later on. Dr. Roo? As far, <clears throat> as far as in my hospital, what we have done is we have uh, written to the CMO and also asked for an opportunity to talk to the CMO to, to also empanel the physicians mentioned in the brain death committee as EOLC empaneled, okay. EOLC empaneled doctors, so that we can use them as the secondary board, one of them, because they, there are six names there. So because all, all of them, I mean, uh, may not be available all the time. So any one of that six, if that gets empaneled, will be functioning as the one person representing the CMO and uh, rest the hospital will appoint, okay? Uh, <clears throat> there won't be a permanent secondary board, but there will be a permanent one person uh, in panel, and then we can make a primary and secondary board on a case-to-case -case basis. This is what we have planned, and I hope this comes through. Okay. The uh, I, I wanted to say one more thing. You see, we what this has enabled is not ACP. This has enabled the instrument of living will. <clears throat> ACP is a larger overarching process. Yes. Right. So ACP facilitates the execution of an instrument. Yes. ACP is not an instrument. It's a process. Yes, yes. yes sir. So, um, Roop, uh, you want to say something quickly? And then I want to yeah. go on to the next question. Yeah. I'm a so, little so, on the panel yeah. questions. Yeah. yeah. So on uh, what uh, Dr. Mani said, uh, so what we are proposing, I mean, this is something that uh, Dhani also might want to say, speak on, is uh, we'll, Dr. Vidhi will facilitate preparing a draft government order somewhat in line with what uh, Dr. Bani is proposing. And I suggest that once that is done, then everybody here has the responsibility of taking it to their respective, whoever they can manage in their state, because the nodal authority is at the state level. Okay, and ask them to use that geo to give uh, instructions to uh, all the functionaries in that particular state. So it will vary. In in Maharashtra, they are called uh, uh, the uh, civil surgeon. In other places, they are called the chief medical officer, and so on. So that functionary then needs to be given a straightforward, simple order. Basically, what uh, uh, is being done at uh, Manipal, we need to generalize that and make it up applicable everywhere. Right, Dhani? Absolutely. Yeah. We just want to make sure that you don't have to go to a chief medical officer every time you need to take a withholding or withdrawal decision. So there should be some kind of permanent panel uh, in place that everyone can rely on and constitute the board that they need as and when the uh, need arises without having to do a runaround of a government office every time uh, you have to take a decision like this. So this can be done only if we, you know, an authority like this issues an, an, uh, a, a more permanent order. So rather than every individual hospital having to go to them, there can be a standing instruction in place. That's the basic uh, idea. So I'm going to ask, um, you know, I'm just changing the order of the questions a little bit so that we can focus on. So uh, Naveen, uh, can you, uh, you know, I've said, I've got a question for you which says, how can the palliative care physician help overcome barriers to appropriate ULC in the hospital. So uh, do you want to... You're muted, uh, Naveen, sorry. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I just don't want to say what is appropriate from my end, you know. Uh, I looked at uh, evidence uh, and, you know, there is a, a beautiful document by NICE and they have done an evidence review in October 2019, uh, which they looked at uh, papers across the world to know what is an appropriate EYLC, especially uh, from a very hospital uh, setting. So one of the important barrier that they have found out is prognostication. You know, 
it, it could be oncologist, it could be ICU physician, their inability to uh, prognosticate and inform their prognosis. You know, upskilling uh, these uh, doctors, both ICU and non-ICU doctors, in skills of prognostication, it's almost becoming a lost art now. We are fo focusing more and more on diagnostics and therapeutics. So I think prognostication, informing prognosis, and second important barrier that they have seen is the timing of information. You know, this information uh, about prognosis has to be uh, uh, provided upfront early uh, and in a more honest and transparent way so that a good decision could be made. So this timing of information, if it is done very late, then we can't provide an appropriate EOLC. And third is also in many of the papers that looked at is communication, you know, how this prognostic information is communicated, the skills in communication, whether they have the ability to conduct a family meeting, ability to involve them in decision making, the process involved in decision making, you know, uh, lack of uh, future planning, ACP knowledge, you know. So there are several uh, barriers that are there. And also there is this readiness for making, having this discussion, you know. Physicians always feel that this is not the right time or the family is not ready to have this discussion. In these uh, barriers, I think palliative care people do have a very important uh, role uh, to play, especially in terms of bringing some objective measures for prognostication, uh, bringing some objective measures in terms of what is the right time to share information, communicating, upskilling the communication. We are now having a series of communication skill training for ED doctors, you know. So uh, also uh, in terms of uh, facilitating a good family meeting, facilitating the shared decision-making, I feel that there are multiple areas uh, palliative care uh, physicians have a role to overcome these barriers. Uh, Dr. Mani, so, uh, you know, actually this uh, question that I skipped which I was going to ask you is about why do intensivists have difficulty in negotiating this transition? You know, and it ties in very well with what um, Naveen is trying to say. Yeah, I'll take it from where yeah. Naveen, uh, yes. Naveen started. And, yes. Uh, sort of, he almost gave a com complete picture of what is going on. Prognostication. Now, I want to say something. See, most of the physicians, particularly in the intensive care setting, you know, they are wary of prognostication. Not that they are not asked to prognosticate, not that they are not prognosticating. Every day anyway, whatever I see intensive is doing, they are talking about the patient, what are the chances for the patient, that's prognostication. They are asked every day, what are the chances? Majority of the answers, they are extremely hedging for one thing, right? Majority of them veer towards poor prognostication. Say chances are poor, everything pitted against the patient, I think whatever we might do, we might end up with uh, something more complications and then it won't end well. You know, this is the message that is being given. So prognostication is done, but done uh, not with great honesty. You know, Naveen said, you've got to be transparent and honest. This, these two values have, are disappearing because of one overriding reason. See the fear of going wrong, fear of being made accountable if you one goes wrong, fear of litigation, right? In all the surveys that we've had so far, limited surveys by Aurora and one other name I forget, you know, in the IJCCM of 150 uh, doctors. And uh, then there is the ACME larger survey of the uh, Asian and Southeast Asian, uh, you know, survey of physicians. They all show that they are very of two things. They have, they are worried about the law. They are worried about administrative interference. Okay, two things, administrative. Right. So they are not worried about whether, whether their skill of prognostication is good or not. Okay, that the focus is gone. They are prognosticating every day, but they are prognosticating loosely, prognosticating, uh, in fact, very defensively. Yes. And you know, this time so, kind of with the uh, lack of trust, 
Uh, no, which, yeah, but see, they are all inter interconnected. See, yes. lack of trust comes from lack of transparency, lack of honesty. That shines through, you know, your lack of honesty. You are not patient-centered, you're, you're self-centered, right? We are supposed to be patient-centered in, uh, in opening up the conversation, supposed to be patient-centered in giving a prognostication so, so that we can we can sit together and think through what, what can be done under the circumstances. It's not universally bad. You know, I always notice this. See, I noticed that in the in the workshop also on communication, Shiva. Yes, sir. I said we are being too negative. Yes. We are not saying anything that is even remotely positive uh, because we are afraid of it. So this dishonesty, this should be corrected in our training, right? Correct. Doctors Absolutely. have to come back to the drawing board and ask to be honest. And ask and to, to face the... to face whatever the consequence. If you're honest, even if the even if somebody turns around and said you said that, it's okay. It's no, okay to bring us to back be to, able to yeah. shown uh, shown differently. Now number I... two. Just number back two, to you know, Naveen. Yeah, Naveen touched upon one more point. Upskilling our communication skills. Because the doctors, no, the intensivists, I think. Uh, when they have to communicate this prognosis, no, they really lack the communication skills. They lack the ability to, you know, um, validate and um, identify and explore the emotions that no, families emotions are experiencing. is another thing. What I'm saying, no, prognostication, I'm saying, they need to yeah. be skilled. Now, but there's one know, more thing Naveen said, and I must explore that. He said, how to accurately, do we have a model where we can accurately predict? Now, all this has been tried. All the scoring systems evolved in the intensive care setting in the last 30 years or so. All the SAP scoring, all the, uh, you know, Apache scoring. And Sorry, what I'm, have you, uh, I'm going to interrupt you. Hmm. I'm going to interrupt you. Know, you know, there's only one line I want to say. Now, there is a possibility that you may improve with the artificial intelligence. We just got a paper in the ICN. You know, it's online first. Artificial intelligence has shown that it could produce a scoring system superior to the traditional scoring system. So we might evolve that way in, the, in that direction. Thank you, sir. So, you know, in my mind, no, more than the ability to prognosticate, it is the ability to communicate the prognosis that is lacking. And that is something which we need to work on. And I'm going to now, you know, I've just got a couple of minutes left. And um, so, uh, I'm going to go to Dhwani and um, you know ask her about, uh, do you think that uh, things need to be simplified further? And uh, is there a place for a, a bill or a law? And how do we advocate, uh, advocate for that? How do we move? So what is the movement that is happening in that sphere? Because we've got some draft bills which are you know, still languishing. Yeah, see, of course, I think things can be simplified even more. And I mean, I, I can say that because since the judgment has, you know, been, uh, was, was passed, I've been trying to come up with a set of frequently asked questions, some FAQs that, uh, that doctors and hospitals might find useful. And I keep tying myself in knots as I read through the guidelines, even of this modified judgment. There are so many questions that doctors ask us. What do we do when we don't want to withdraw treatment, but the family wants to? What do we do when we want treatment to be withdrawn, but the, uh, when the doctor doesn't want treatment to be withdrawn, but we want to? What do we do in the case of brainstem death? What do we do in pediatric patients? What do we do if there is a later advanced directive? Are we legally bound to follow a directive now? There are some answers that I can come up with based on the principles that the court has laid down and, and, and keeping in mind what the spirit of the judgment is and what the guidelines say. But there are many, many questions that will be resolved only when there is legislation on this because only legislation can comprehensively try and answer all of these different kinds of scenarios. So specifically in the context of uh, ACPs, you know, it can lay down more rules for how, you know, what kinds of witnesses you should have. There can be some legislation on who you should identify as the next of kin. This is the most popular question that I, that I get asked. How do we, how do we identify who is the next, uh, uh, next friend or the guardian or the next of kin? What do we do if I want to revoke a directive? 
what do we do if there are multiple directives uh what can you do is does this judgment apply to withholding or withdrawal at home uh what happens you know so there are so many questions like this which can only be answered in a in, in the form of a legislation now with dr roop and dr simha and dr mani and you know with the guidance of you know and the experience of people like dr salens we have drafted a legislation uh, i mean a, a draft bill on this but and, and this is actually a draft bill that dr mani if you recall we had even shared with the health secretary when we were having discussions during the a uh, course of the hearings in the supreme court we had had a an online meeting with the solicitor general and the health secretary and told them that there is a legislation that has been drafted and you know we are very happy to have a wider consultative process around this as well although you know we we have even even this legislation has been created after a couple of rounds of uh, iteration but any all kinds of public comments and all the experiences of doctors and patients are always uh, welcome now i'm going to stand that the court uh, that the government took in court is that they don't intend to bring any legislation on this so they are not interested the union ministry at the moment or at least for the purpose of the hearings in court was not interested in passing legislation so i would say that the next step of advocacy is of course to go to state governments but before we do that it's very important for us as a community of lawyers doctors patients in this space to build some or to document some experience of implementing these directives so uh, these these new guidelines so let's not again throw up our hands and say we can't do anything until there's legislation let's right. try in good faith to implement these guidelines in the way we can you come to us with whatever problems you have in actually implementing these guidelines we will document these barriers and we will figure out and we will use these challenges that you experience as a way of advocating for legislation on this perhaps with a sympathetic state government right so you know i think uh, we are looking for a road map ahead and uh, so we require a road map uh, for the uh, legal part we require a road map for uh, targeting uh, doctors other than palliative care physicians uh and maybe intensivists how to you know get the message across we need a road map for you know talking to the public building greater public awareness so that you know uh, we can have advanced care planning uh, like uh, you know rupas put in the comments in the chat that it is like uh, vaccination in pediatrics so so these are all uh, road maps that we need and i think uh we will get there and there is a lot of advocacy that still needs to be done now you know uh, yes. question is not on the yeah and this is the last question i'm going to ask to the panel and then we're going to take questions from the uh, yeah so navin uh, you know i'm really uh, piqued uh, my curiosity is piqued by what dhwani said she said that we must be able to document and share our experiences in this regard how the supreme court judgment has uh, you know helped us make or not helped us make so uh, do you have any suggestions or do you have any ideas on how such research can be prepared which can you know help then uh, drive the process of legislation and stuff i feel that uh, uh, systematically documenting the experiences of those who are uh, doing what the supreme court has said you mean something like a registry uh, so i feel that it could be more like a mixed method study kind of thing where we do a large scale survey across board uh, uh and uh, uh purposefully pick a few centers to uh, systematically qualitatively document what what are the facilitators or what are the things that's hindering uh, the the implementations of the supreme court provisions and if the provisions are available but they are not implementing what's preventing them from implementing or if the provisions are available and they are very happy to implement what's making them implement you know and uh, uh, government only understands data and the data has to be large and data has to have both quantitative and qualitative component and i think only data could help move the government and you know government always talks about data you know we should provide them data Yes. and what <laughs> yes. group uh, 
Dr. Mani, any comments on this? And yeah. you know, I'm just wondering, Archana, how we can... Uh, yeah, Rup, please go ahead. Yeah. So a few things taking in from the uh, comments so far. If anybody looks up uh, at the beginning of the chat session, I've put out uh, two links to downloadable uh, stuff that is written from uh, uh, an organization called Respecting Choices. They are an organization which in their area have better than 95% coverage. They are, they are the tops. And how do they do this? They do this by uh, training facilitators across the board. So facilitators are not physicians. In fact, I've been on one of their sessions and I found the physicians were terrible, really. Because uh, physicians always know everything and they always say everything. Uh, here is the other way around. You got to listen. So they train facilitators across the board. And those two documents are very useful for us to understand what the concept of advanced care planning is. And advanced care planning at its heart is just making sure that an individual's wishes are in some ways actioned. About wishes about health. In whatever way they are actioned, they have to be followed. The second is the point that Dr. Mani took on about uh, intensivists not giving prognosis. But all of us, prognosis is something that has fallen off the medical mind and map. Remember that in the last century, prognosis, diagnosis, treatment and prognosis were three equal parts. And then prognosis gradually dwindled and fell away. And we got in some ways, uh, again, there's another link there. And that's by a guy called Chris Rackis. It's a little heavy read, but it's called Prognostication and Bioethics. If you do not prognosticate, uh, forget about the ethics of managing end-of-life care. You can't do it. So uh, what I tell people again and again is that uh, obviously prognostication is important. That's foreseeing. But we need to marry it with the basic skill that palliative care physicians have, and that is of communicating, that is foretelling. And if you do not learn how to foretell, your foresight atrophies, and you see that in intensivists across the board. Not just intensivists, my own fraternity, all physicians. We do not foretell, so we've allowed our foresight to atrophy. I think one of the reasons why it was allowed to atrophy was we were hedging, right? We were afraid of the law. We were afraid it's of a, what the perception would it's be. Chakravyo. Yeah, Chakravyo. So we allowed because we started. See, prognostication is inherent to communication every day in the ICU. I keep saying this. Yes. It's not that prognostication is atrophied or gone, but it is not, it is hampered by the fear of litigation, of being, uh, being perceived as, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> somebody who's making a mistake or somebody who can be held to account. You understand? Because uh, most of it is private sector. So you are worried about the consequences with the administration, you're worried about the consequences with the family, should you be proven somewhat not accurate. So this is a problem. This is, this needs, we have to work, when we do the communication workshops, we have to work on this, how to remove the fear, how to be able to give a scientific, scientific and, and accurate and honest uh, prognostication. And the prognostication process can be improved upon, as I said, by new technology, of AI-based scoring systems. But one agree. thing I must say, it is subjective and objective um, understanding of prognosis. It's not, it's not mathematical or arithmetical. Nowhere it is in the world. And you have the additional thing of being able to look at the patient over a period of time, the trajectory. So you integrate the trajectory. So it's, a, it's an art as well. It's a skill to be acquired like any other thing, uh, any other procedure in the ICU. So once we have this load from the head that you know you're some way legally culpable with, that is gone. I think this will facilitate an improved uh, process of communication, which includes improved and more honest and more scientifically accurate prognostication. And this is crucial. This is the first step. Prognostication yes. is the first step towards getting the first board, then the second board, and so on and then the implementation. Prognostication is most difficult in neurology. And uh, let me assure you, uh, 
it's it's all part of uh, serious illness communication. Finally, you get back to the same. I don't think artificial intelligence is going to help us at all. I mean, it's finally real intelligence that works. Yes, I think you know because it it, it involves empathy and the skill to communicate. And what that's the, what I mean. It, it has, has to be subjective and objective. But you see, the objective component could be improved upon as medicine is evolving. It is subject and objective. You, if you see all our guidelines, say subjective and objective and iteration. These are the two things. Yeah, true. Sir. And honesty and openness. Yes. All these put together will give you a good prognostic. Prognostic. Uh, okay, I'm going sir. to. I'm going to button and and say that um, you know now I have got about ten minutes left and um, you know Archana does have a session where people can put their hand up and ask questions. I'm not sure how well that is going to work because most of the questions in the chat have rapidly gone through them. I've seen that, you know, Roop and Dr. Mani and Dhwani all have been very active and they've been answering actively and most of the questions have got answered. But if there are people who have any burning questions, they may raise their hand and uh, I'm keeping a watch and then I can ask. Uh, you can write the question on the chat and then I will allow you to ask it. Hmm? Naveen, anything else you want to say, uh, you want to add? No, I saw Anjum's hand. Yeah, Anjum. So we should okay, go. Anjum. Thank you, Naveen. Thank you, Shiva. I wanted to draw attention to Dr. Tendra's question uh, because she has specifically said that if we initiate withholding of support with the family's consent, is that she's added, she's added two parts of the question, withholding and withdrawing support in a patient without AMD. And uh, we've always maintained, and you will all, uh, I think, support me on this, that withholding support is a medical decision. And we, I think, need not go through the AMD for withholding support. So we need to clarify that. If, am, I, am I mistaken? Or is Tendral justified in not proceeding with aggressive or inappropriate care if the family and the patient are on the same page? Because I think the... Uh, what you discuss in the chat is slightly confusing. Yeah, so I think Anjum, you mean um, withholding uh, one may initiate uh, as a physician. It's a medical decision. Like DNA CPR is said to be a medical decision, but withdrawing uh, you think is not uh, medical. I'd ask Dr. Mani to uh, probably, uh, and then the others. You see, uh, actually, I, actually, it's sorry, not so. Dr. Mani. Dr. Mani, I'm just clarifying. Um, I've ah. got the, the uh, question even more complicated. What I mean is, I think that Tendral wanted to know that if I want to withhold support and I do not have an AMD and the whole clinical team and the patient's family agree that withholding is uh, appropriate, can I go ahead with that legally? So if, I the, pa if, the, yeah. if the patient is, is an incompetent, then the court holds that this is not enough, right? Because the physicians and uh, family may be complicit in make, taking a wrong decision, right? That is the whole idea. That is why the two level, that is why more than one physician. So, you know, this is also, see, having more than one physician for any withdrawal or withholding decision is common to all jurisdictions across the world. We are not making any separate rules for with, with, withholding versus with, withdrawal because both are rooted in the same principle of that intervention not being beneficial. So you can't have one without the other. If you only had with, withholding and no withdrawal, you would be under treating a lot of people because always there is it's not a clear cut black and white situation, right? Many times you're not, you're not sure, you're feeling your way and you might, be, you might need to have a trial of intensive care first. And then if you have a trial of intensive care and you don't have the option of withdrawal, then you will be over treating. So to get it right, because of this gray area, most people are confused about this. Who is to decide? How can you be so sure? How can you be so sure about prognosis? Now, all these are answered by having both withholding and withdrawal with, with the similar approach, right? So that you feel your way into proper understanding. So you get closest to what the principles of the, our courts have, have laid down. So if I may just- they are, not going to, they are not going to allow you just to have family and physicians talking together and 
and uh, having a decision. Yeah. Yes, that's right. I just wanted to add that to what Dr. Mani said. So yes, you can withhold, withdraw, provided you go through the process that I just uh, described. No. I mean, while that would apply to uh, hospitalized cases, the palliative care community has been practicing withholding therapy for patients who are at home for such a long time. So uh, does this yeah. hold only for hospitalized patients? And so, yes, and for, yeah. Can yeah, you there, is a, there is a paragraph in the judgment in the in the chief uh, justice's opinion that bears this out where you can see clearly that this this judgment was intended to apply only to cases where patients are admitted to hospital so it's meant to reduce the uncertainty that arises when someone is comes to hospital and you don't know what's going to happen to allow to act as a guide for doctors to allow families to take these decisions more easily so it's quite clear from the judgment that its applicability is intended only for cases where someone is in a healthcare establishment. And, you know, so if I were to stretch that, so sometimes what happens is, you know, at home, uh, the uh, families are not able to manage uh, patients. They've got some acute problem, but they don't want to um, do particular treatments or go to ICU. So they get admitted to the hospital and they're in the room, you know, and uh, they opt to withhold. That means you're withholding an ICU shift. You're withholding. So, so that withholding, which is happening in the uh, rooms, uh, that seems to be a gray area. And uh, I mean, it would be uh, it would be very difficult, uh, especially you know, if you look at acute illness, what Dr. Mani has been describing. That in the ICU setting is a different ball game. Whereas withholding in the a setting where chronic illness is there and it's the palliative care setting that seems to be different you know it I, i'm not sure how to uh... it, it may yeah, i mean i'm sure it seems different in the way in which you practice it but as in legally it's very difficult to distinguish between these two because they are both cases where someone is terminally ill where there is no hope of uh, you know further cure or and that person is in a hospital setting so I mean, I'd say that uh, once you are in that kind of setting, it becomes difficult to uh, avoid the process that the court has laid down. Naveen, Anjum, you want to say something? Yeah, please go I ahead. Wanted Naveen's, I wanted Naveen's insight on how to handle this gray Naveen. area, Shishiva, that you've described very, very clearly. Naveen? So, uh, thank you, Shiva. Uh, the thing is, you know, uh, we all are talking in mainly in terms of legal and we are also talking in terms of... Uh, uh, what the current provisions are, both from the 2018 and the 2023 judgments. But uh, in palliative care, uh, when we are practicing, especially when you brought up the point about uh, home-based palliative care and the deaths happening at home, where none of these uh, come into play, what I feel is that if we feel, uh, maybe this is a very superficial uh, and a broad statement, if we feel that we are ethically right in what we are doing, you know, and we are able to justify it ethically right, all our decisions, like uh, we have so many of our patients right now, which we are referred, we looked after a patient with an 85% burns uh, who died uh, today, actually, where we had a family meeting yesterday. And uh, the next of kin is the spouse who also had similar amount of burns, who is in the next bed of this patient. You know, how we make uh, decisions here are very complex uh, and, and very iterative, and we cannot be very, uh, this bringing in this black and white probably, I don't think is possible at all. And I think first is we need to be clear in the way we are uh, thinking and the way we are making it. I agree. Shiva, can I add one word here? Yeah, yeah, you please. Know, I, I agree that you don't have to go through all the two boards for every every single case. You know, I agree. You know, I uh, but even you know, it, there has to be some common sense running through it. And also, the the basic principle is having multiple physicians and a good communication and family and the and the multiple physicians are on the same page. That is the principle, which is quite inviolable. Uh, and which should be followed. We may not follow in the letter, but we should follow in the spirit for most for all cases. Uh, Stanley has his hand up. So Stanley, please. Uh, yes, thank you, Shiva. Uh, thank you for all the excellent inputs and uh, also the so-called victory we have had 
in the context of advanced directives, you know, but we have a long way to go. And unless we have the aim for this legislation, I don't think we are going to get far. You no, know, we'll go on talking about it, but we need to, is there an alternative way instead of just waiting for collecting data? Shouldn't we do what is ethically right? Shouldn't we, you know, there's so many things which are ethically wrong being done in front of our eyes every day. Where do we, as palliative care physicians, as intensivists, as lawmakers, all of us, let's get together and put the pressure on the government. Let us have a time frame and let them push this forward, take it forward. Otherwise, how long are we going to wait? So many people are dying. The country is pushed into abject poverty. We are talking of millions being pushed into abject poverty. So somewhere we should have a different strategy or an additional strategy or something, you know, put our minds together. I think we have to pressurize the government. How can they say that we're not interested in legislation at the moment? Let one of their dear ones be dying and let's see what they say. You know, you're right, um, Stanley. And uh, that's why, you know, I think the advocacy part uh, is something which all of us need to participate much more. Yes. And we need to move not only for legislation. And, you know, yesterday I was in conversation with um, a doctor who's a professor in a government medical college. So she was saying, so there is a problem of access to healthcare as well. And then within uh, access, uh, when patients come into, say, government medical colleges there, uh, the financial struggles are so big. And all this question of, you know, being pushed into abject poverty. So 100% I'm in agreement and I'm sure most of the panelists also that we need to be uh, ethically driven in whatever we do. And we have the four principles which guide us. And that is something which we must follow. Uh, Dr. Shiv Kumar, uh, would you like to say something, sir? Shiv Kumar Kumbhar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm Dr. Shiv Kumar Kumbhar from uh, Karnataka. Uh, uh, so thank you very much for the uh, inputs. Sir, practically speaking, in a places like uh, Taluk and small districts, where you do not find one more than one or two physicians to take even a second opinion, and uh, district hospital per se, uh, to refer into the district hospital where there is a chief medical officer, they are all just with the hierarchy, they become the district medical officer uh, in the district with the just the MBBS qualification. They do not have any access. They do not know what exactly the palliative care. They do not know what is end of life care. They do not know what is the how to what is the mean by withholding or withdrawing the process. So even if the law 2023 has a simplified, the, it is simplified to the very little extent. Practically speaking, catching hold of these people for the second opinion or having a second board or attorney, and even if you go to the judiciary to get the attorney get it signed, whatever it is, and uh, they do not have a very very knowledge. Uh, they, they, they can't even just uh, sign a notarize unless they go to that process. I think, again, it's going to be a very lengthy procedure, practically. Ultimately, what the practice of physicians are late is things that rather than going to the such kind of uh, hassles, it's better to go against the medical advice. That's what the people have been doing even in the district in the Talika places, sir. You know, this against medical advice is, um, is something which, uh, you know, we feel very passionately about. Yes, and, sir. Yeah, and the against medical advice, you know, it happens um, that the family is left with a lot of guilt. The yeah. patient suffers a lot. Appropriate palliative uh, care cannot be given. Uh, while it might help to avoid the uh, financial uh, yes. troubles that might arise, it seems to be a very poor way out. And I think, again, the way seems to be to have good advocacy. So yes, you know, I'm going to uh, uh, exercise my right as the moderator to say that we've uh, spent a good uh, one and a half hours and we've had a wonderful uh, discussion. So uh, I'm going to now hand over to uh, Dr. Savita, who, who is with us, uh, to you know thank all of us and uh, propose uh, what of thanks. Is Savita? there 15 minutes more? Oh, uh, is, are there 15 minutes more? No, we had thought of 7.45. 7.45. <laughs> <laughs> you have to no, now. I mean, Thank I'm, you. I'm all willing to go on and on, but I Archana, think, you are the, I think uh, this is ceremony. giving us an idea of having another part two of this. Okay. 
we can go ahead with that and maybe have a series of uh, this discussions that would be better sure. Sure. but for now thank you uh, all the participants and uh, heartfelt thanks to all our distinguished speakers it has been a very very enlightening discussion and i think just to summarize that uh, iapc and the palliative care community in india has to take forward advanced care planning as our baby and uh, one way of doing it is early conversations early documentation uh, clinics we can have in our uh, opds and uh, but you know uh, not every patient has to go through this process that is also very important what dhwani just said is that these are for hospitalized patients these are for the patients where it's difficult for the family and the physicians to reach a consensus that is where the supreme court guidelines come in but for patients where we are making ethical decisions every day for our home care patients for the majority of palliative care patients ethical decisions with good prognostication skills still remain the cornerstone and you do not have to go through this process for each and every patient but only when you are clear and when you are convinced about this whole legal and ethical issue it is only then that you can convince your patients your families your colleagues the administration and the policy makers so i think we all need to talk more about this i promise we will have more conversations on this topic in the future and uh, i think we need to really create a lot of awareness both the community and in the healthcare uh, workers the doctors and the policy makers also so you know, thank you all very is, much and uh, uh, if i may just add something uh, yes, so yes, i just doctor. want to say you know palliative care is an attitude of mind so while the palliative community should take this forward all of us physicians need to develop this uh, attitude you know of uh, of what palliative medicine stands for in terms of its uh, holistic approach and that if if you ask me is not really uh, restricted to palliative care dr mani always says you know that i mean the intensives have to become palliative care physicians when the need is there the neurologists have to become palliative care physicians when the need is there and this is something which uh, we should all work on and the palliative community should take the lead for this advocacy very true so thank you very much and uh, and more of this will soon come so we will let you know when we have the next one thank you sir so well, thank you all the panelists uh, thank, thank you, you everyone. thank you archana thank you. and not yeah not not the least our team archana and nisha thank you so much for all yes, your support yes. and we've missed thank uh, you. Dr. Nagesh Sima, because uh, he couldn't come, yes. and I think Dr. Tushma Bhatnagar, uh, she was on flight, and so uh, I mean, Savita, you filled in so well for her, and uh, you know, Dr. Mani, Dr. Roop, Dr. Uh, Navin, uh, Dhwani, uh, all everybody, all panelists have been so succinct, and they've been so active on the chat that all the questions I think have been answered, and if there are still questions remaining. you can please send them to uh, the iipc and we will try to answer them as best as possible and now looking forward to a second uh, edition of um, uh, end of life care appropriate end of life care thank you so much bye thank you thank you bye. all very much thank you